seat. Well, good evening. Welcome to Kairos. It's great to see you here tonight, and I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad that you are in this place with us. Um, my name is Mike. I'm the Kairos pastor, and if I haven't met you yet, I want to meet you. I think that uh, your story is very special, and that God has a very special story he's telling through your life. And uh, if you're here tonight, we think that that's something that's not, something that just happened on uh, blind chance or through random accident, but that God is telling a story through you and we want to be a part of it. And so one of the best things you can do is just to say hi. You can say hi to us after the service, uh, right down front here. Some of us are going to be here after the service. There's also going to be some people in the back, uh, but don't leave without meeting somebody because these kinds of relationships change people's lives. Now, uh, tonight, if you've got a copy of the scriptures, why don't you open it to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be starting verse 9 tonight. And as you guys turn there, I've got a, a scorching hot take, okay? I've got a hot take for you tonight. Uh, and I'm going to just kind of put this out there. I think that COVID ruined being sick. <laughs> That's right. COVID ruined being sick. Now, I'm old enough to remember life before COVID. And uh, back in the day... Uh, if you got sick and you went to work, people would thank you. You remember that? You show up at work, go to school, had a running nose. People were like, thank you for being so committed. That's literally what people would tell you. They'd be like, thank you for showing up. If you uh, coughed, you'd just be like, oh yeah, it's just my allergies, it's just kicking up. And no one would think anything different. Today, if somebody coughs in this place, we're going to stare you down and give you the stink eye. We're going to be like, who let you out of the house, right? Because even though we may not be afraid of COVID, although there might be some in this room who are still like very concerned about it, uh, most of us just don't want to be inconvenienced anymore, right? We're like, man, if I get the positive test, I can't go on that trip that I want to take. I can't go do that thing I want to do. I have to be home. And... In this idea that's tied up within this about not wanting to get sick, we find our, our truth tonight. See, there's some of us um, who try to stay away from some people because we don't want to get what they got. My mom, uh, when I was little, told me that you are who your friends are. You got to pick your friends wisely. Your mom say something like that? You are who your friends are? Uh, and, and that's always kind of stuck with me. Like, who are my friends and what are they doing to influence me? And... The reality is, is that many of us uh, try to stay away from people who are bad influences because we want to, don't want to be around all the wrong people. Uh, but tonight, we're going to find that Jesus does something different, that Jesus treats people who are different than him uh, with great care and compassion. He runs to them. And as we kick off this series, Jesus, Friend of Sinners, I want you to fall in love with Jesus in a new way. I want you to experience Jesus in a new way. I want you to get closer to Jesus as we see how he pursues people who the world says aren't good enough to come to church. Here's something I hear from you guys sometimes, okay? This is something I hear, true story, is that if I went to church, the roof would fall down on me. I don't know why people think that or say that. I think some of it has to do with feeling like we're not good enough to, to come to church. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But tonight, we're gonna look at some people who definitely felt that way. So in Matthew chapter nine, let's read the text together. Uh, let's read right here out of the scriptures. Matthew 9, verse 9 says this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And while he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with these tax collectors and sinners? Now, when he heard this, he said, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, a couple quick observations here as we look at this text. The first is that Jesus picks all the wrong people. He picks all the wrong people. So our story starts with Jesus walking through the streets of Capernaum. He sees a man named Matthew who's working. Matthew is a tax collector. And he's not just any kind of tax collector. He's a mochis. 
Now you may go, I don't know what that means. What that means is that he's a tax collector who taxed boats. He taxed anything that came off a ship. And as Jesus is walking by, he says, Matthew, I want you to follow me. And Matthew hears Jesus' invitation and leaves behind tax collecting. Now, Matthew's the wrong kind of guy, okay? And the reason why he's the wrong kind of guy is because he has chosen to take up the most despised job in all of Israel. He has chosen to work for Rome. And the Romans were cruel overlords. They are occupying forces. Jesus lived in occupied territory. And Matthew turned his back on his people and began to tax them. Now, I know tax season's coming up right now. Some of you are filing your very first taxes. You're terrified that they're going to come get you if you don't fill them out right. All right? Some of us have been doing taxes for years, and we just hate this time of year. We're just hoping for an extension. We're just, like, not wanting to go through the whole process. We hate this time of year. In Jesus' day, the tax collectors would charge whatever they wanted. And this is where it got awkward. Matthew was someone who taxed Jesus' best friends. Remember Peter, James, John? What are they? They're all fishermen. And who's the guy who asks them for the tax? It's Matthew. And Jesus looks at Matthew and says, follow me. Now, if you remember the story of Peter being called into Jesus' service, you will remember that this is the exact same phrase that Jesus uses to ask Peter to be his disciple. Jesus says, follow me. And Peter leaves behind his family business of fishing and becomes a disciple and follows Jesus. Jesus uses the exact same language for the good guys and the bad guys. He picks the wrong people. Now, Matthew is so overwhelmed by this invitation by Jesus that he goes to his house and throws a party. In fact, there's a parallel passage in Luke chapter 5. You don't have to turn there tonight. But you find that Matthew throws a huge rager for all of his buddies. Throws a huge party, has food and drink there, and Jesus goes to the party. And while he's at the party, all of the riffraff of town, all of Matthew's friends, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the ones that the, the religious people call sinners, they all come to the party. And Jesus is hanging out with them. Jesus chooses the wrong kind of people. He doesn't pick the best and the brightest in Israel. He picks people who are fishermen, and tax collectors to be his disciples because this invitation, the follow me, is not just any kind of invitation. This invitation is actually an invitation to a friendship. You see, Jesus was a rabbi. And what rabbis would do is they would call their disciples to be a part of their life and their journey and to be people who are with them. And this is really important to me because at one point in my life, I was the wrong kind of person. And I, I know that some of you guys don't know me beyond being here as Pastor Mike here at Kairos. And you may look at the fact that I don't have a beard or tattoos. You go, okay, that guy's always followed the Lord. He's been a good kid his whole life. But there was a season in college that I was the wrong kind of person. Um, and uh, my wife didn't know that version of me. But one day, uh, she went to a wedding with me in Minnesota. And uh, she went along with me because uh, one of my best friends was getting married. And he invited both of us to go, and he asked me to be in his wedding party. And so I was a little mad because the first wedding he was in, I was his best man. The second time, I was just a groomsman, but who's counting, okay? So we went to the wedding. It was a unique wedding. I'd never been in this wedding before, a wedding quite like this, because it was on a boat uh, on a river. It was like one of these big like river boats. And so you couldn't get off the boat at any point. The boat just got on the river, and we were all stuck and we were just there for the next four hours. We were stuck on this boat. And as the party continues to go forward, we went through the ceremony, and then we had the reception on the boat. They stuck me at the head table, and they put my wife in the back with a bunch of people that she didn't know. So just a, just a professional tip for some of you guys who are going to get married uh, over the next couple of years. If you have a friend who's in your wedding party and they are married, don't put their spouse in the back of the room by themselves, okay? That's just a bad idea, okay? So my wife is in the back. She's bored out of her mind. She's never been to Minnesota. She does not know any of my friends from college. She's in the back of the room with a bunch of strangers. They ask her who she's there with, and she points at me, and they go, oh, you're friends with, 
you're married to Mike. That's cool. What does Mike do? She said, Mike's a pastor. And they would have thought that I had robbed a bank. Like, they absolutely came unglued. They said, Mike is a pastor? Mike Harder is a pastor? And they began texting all their friends, like, oh my gosh, do you believe this news? Mike Harder is a pastor. And Tabitha started saying, like, what, what, what happened in college that Mike would be that, that shocking, uh, as, as, as that news would be so shocking that Mike is a pastor? And as I heard her tell me this story, I started wondering how I misplayed things in college because apparently I should have leaned into that bad boy mentality a lot more because I didn't know that I was such a bad deal in college. And yet, at one point, I was so far from the Lord that People are like, there's no way that guy is going to ever be a spiritual leader. Thank goodness for grace, because Jesus picks all the wrong people. And the reason I tell you that story tonight is because I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how you would describe yourself. Maybe you think you're somebody who's been a good person your whole life, or maybe you're someone who, who is coming to Kairos for the very first time tonight, and you feel like... If people knew your story, that you would be rejected. Thanks, guys. Maybe you feel like if you were known in this place, that people wouldn't want to be your friend. But Jesus doesn't operate like that. Jesus is a friend to people who are on the margins. Jesus pursues people who are far from God. And Jesus desires to be in a relationship with each and every one of us. Jesus wants to be our friend. And I want you to see here something that's really important, is that before Jesus invites Matthew to do a single thing, before Matthew does a single Bible study, before Matthew entertains any friends, Jesus invites Matthew into a relationship because God wants Matthew to be close relationally to Jesus before he does anything for Jesus. Jesus desires friendship first. He desires to be our friend. And he offers that to Matthew before Matthew does a single thing for God. And the same thing is true for you and I. Sometimes we start thinking about all the things that we can do for God and we forget that we are first called to be with God. God wants us to be with him. Now, in our story, first thing we saw was that Jesus picks the wrong people. The second thing we kind of see here is that religious people second-guess Jesus, which is pretty shocking, right? These religious people second-guess the Son of God. And what you find next is that the Pharisees, who are the keepers of the law, begin to say, Jesus, why are you hanging out with these people? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? These people aren't good enough for you, Jesus. And the reason why they're concerned about Jesus spending time with these sinners is because they thought that sin was contagious, that if you spent time with sinners, you would be infected by that sin, that it would stick to you, that you would be ceremonially unclean and you would not be able to enter into worship gatherings, that you weren't gonna be someone that God would look upon with favor. And they were saying, Jesus, you need to leave these people and hang out with the righteous. And what we see next is Jesus' response. And it's fascinating. Because this is what Jesus says in verse 13. I'm sorry, verse 12. He says this. He says, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners. Now, have this blackboard up here because I want you to see something here that's, that's important. So what Jesus does here is he does something that a first century Jew would do. He communicates a truth by saying two similar statements and then he has the interpretation for it between them. So what we do is, what we see here is we find Jesus saying this. He says, um, he says, I did not come for the well. So People who are well, so I not come for them. Uh, the people who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick. And then he says, 
Um, it is not the righteous. that I've come, but the sinners. So what you see him doing is he, he equates these things together. So he says, sinners and sick people, it's one category. The well and the righteous, they're another category. And the doctor is me. Do you see that? They're similar concepts. And Jesus says, those who are sick need a doctor, the well people don't. Sinners need me, the righteous don't. And then he goes on to say something that's absolutely fascinating. He says this about uh, what this means and how to interpret this. He says that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. So he says mercy is greater than sacrifice. What does this all mean? Well, First thing that this means is that Jesus offers spiritual healing for anyone who understands their need. See, the Bible tells us that every single one of us is a sinner. We can't save ourselves by our own strength. We can't get there on our own. We can't overcome the sickness of sin on our own. We need someone to help us. And the starting point, the price of admission to getting there is realizing that we need Jesus. That we need Jesus. But the second piece is important too, is that Jesus desires friendship with us. And this is an insane statement. A first century Jew wouldn't think about God in these categories, that God actually wants to be their friend. Now you may say, where do you get friendship out of what Jesus is saying? And we find that right here in this phrase, mercy. This is the key phrase that we find. Because the Jews would say, if I have sin or I'm sick, I need to sacrifice. Okay? I need to bring an animal before God. That animal will be killed on my behalf. And then me and God are good. But Jesus says, I've got the sacrifice covered. I am the sacrifice. What I want is I want you to understand this concept of mercy. Now, we gotta do a little bit of work here. So Hosea chapter six, verse six, you might see that in your Bibles. If you look in, your, in the margins of some of your Bibles, you might see that. Hosea six, verse six, is actually what Jesus is quoting. And because he's speaking Aramaic, he's not saying the word mercy. He's saying the word kesed, which is the Hebrew word for God's covenant loyalty, which carries with it the idea of deep abiding friendship, a covenant relationship between two entities. The closest example that we can find of this is, is marriage. You know, marriage vows are so incredibly powerful. Have you ever like stopped to actually think about what's going on in those marriage vows? Because what you see when you see two people come together to, to proclaim their love for each other and to take these vows is they're saying, no matter what, we're going to be for each other. Even when we're rich or when we're poor. When gas prices are $6 a gallon or $2 a gallon, we're in it together. When we're, when we're healthy or when we're sick, we're not going anywhere. We're in it forever. That's the kind of friendship and the kind of loyalty that Jesus is saying that he wants from his people. He's saying, I want that kind of friendship, not physical sacrifice. I want you to be someone who's my friend. And that's what I'm offering to you. Relational friendship. And God is offering that to every single one of us in this room. See, sometimes we think about God and we think about him as a overlord or a cosmic boss or someone who's absent or some kind of commander, but we don't think about him as our friend. We don't think about him as a friend where he wants to be known. But the truth of the gospel is that God's plan to change the world is friendship. And that's what he tells his disciples on the last night of his life. He says, you're no longer my servants, but now you are my friends. Jesus wants us to be with him before we do anything for him. He desires us to be close to him and to be his friend. 
And Jesus isn't just someone who lived a long time ago. What I'm so reminded about when I think about Jesus is that he is someone who's present and active and in the moment that we're in. He's here. He wants to be that kind of friend for you. He wants to have that kind of loyalty and affection and relationship with you. But often what we do is we say, God, I'm just gonna serve you and that's how I'm gonna express my friendship. But Jesus just wants your presence. He wants you to just pursue his face and to know how good he really is. So tonight, I think we have to reflect on what this means for us, okay? Some of us think that we um, are pretty good at following Jesus because we're good at doing a lot of things. We're good at going to church. Man, every time the doors are open, we're there. I mean, you guys all get a gold star tonight. You guys came when it was raining, right? You're like, we're good at going to church and church activities. But sometimes we're so good at doing those things that we don't slow down enough to actually be with God. Some of us are really good at caring for other people. And we look at our good behavior and we're like, that's enough. And that's our sacrifice. But Jesus says, I'm not here for people who are really good at doing things. I just want to be with you because I'm asking you to be my friend and to be close to me because because I've given the sacrifice so you can come and be close to the Father. So as we consider this series, we thought one of the best ways we could finish out tonight was just simply by having communion. Communion is a time where we celebrate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And we declare that he's come not just simply to pay the price for our sin, but to be connected to us and to be our friend. That he's going to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And you know, one of the things I was thinking about the other day, I, the other day I was thinking about just where I'm at in my life. And um, I, I think as I've gotten older and I've added children into my life and I've gotten a lot busier, it's hard to spend time with friends. I don't know if this is something that any of you guys who are like in my stage of life feel this. When you're in college, there's friends everywhere. You just throw a rock and you see a friend. Like you just have like all these people who are kind of in the same stage of life as you. Once you graduate from college though, let me just tell you, those of you guys are in college, it's a wasteland out there sometimes, okay? Like it's hard to find friends. And even when you get married, it's tougher because both of you guys have to like the people, okay? That's the secret. You both have to be like, we're cool. You can go on these double dates with people sometimes. You're like, uh, I love him. I don't know if we want to hang out with him again, though, because she's kind of crazy. Or it's the other way around. You're like, she's awesome. But that dude, like, I can't talk to him at all. All he wanted to talk about was sports the whole night, right? So you kind of have, like, this weird thing where it's hard to make friends. In fact, uh, somebody said this the other day, that Jesus' greatest miracle wasn't walking on water or healing the sick. It was the fact that he had 12 friends as a grown-up man, okay? (laughs) He had 12 friends. And we can feel that way sometimes. But I was thinking about that as I was like going through a season where I was like, okay, a lot of my friends don't live in town anymore. Like a lot of my closest friends, the people that I was doing life with when I was in college or as a single adult, because I had a ton of friends when I was single. And now like my kids rule my life. Like who are my friends? And I realized that the longing that I had, the deepest longing of my heart to have a friend is ultimately just an arrow towards Jesus. See, all of us sometimes feel like We've been let down by people who we thought were our friends. They talked bad about us or they were different when they were with other people than they were with us or they, they left us behind. We've been let down by friends, but Jesus is the friend who will never leave us. And investing in that friendship by actually spending time with them every day, by slowing down sometimes and not putting anything on the calendar other than just spending time with Jesus is the best investment of our time to press deeper into this friendship with Jesus. And so tonight we're gonna take that time, uh, we're just gonna start there by just being still enough to talk to him, okay? So we're gonna have communion. I'm gonna invite the communion team to come up up front. I'm gonna ask our band to come up too. And... One of the things we do around here is something we call 120 seconds. 120 seconds is simply two minutes where we're still and we reflect on the message and the heart behind it. And uh, tonight, our 120 seconds is going to be a time that we're going to take right before we take our, off, our, our, our time of communion. 
And our time of communion is a time where we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. Jesus said this, he said, no man has any greater love than to lay his life down for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. He had his body broken for us. He was the sacrifice so we could be friends with God. And we celebrate that when we take the juice, which is a symbol of his blood, and we take the bread, which is a symbol of his body, which was broken for us. And tonight, if you're a Christian, we invite you to come and partake of these elements. The band's gonna play, and we're gonna invite you to come to these stations. We have stations all across the front here. We've got a couple stations in the back. And I know it's gonna get a little awkward because you're gonna probably run into some people and you may kind of like have to mill around a little bit. But we wanted this to be something personal where you can come to a person and receive the elements, then take them back to your seat and take them when you're ready. And when you do it, I want you to reflect upon Jesus and his friendship that he's offering you. For some of you, you've never said yes to it. You've never said yes to God's friendship. And tonight, tonight you can do that. How do you say yes to God's friendship? Was well, simply hearing his call, the same call that he said to Matthew, which is to follow me. You don't do that by saying a magical prayer. You simply say, I'm just gonna do whatever Jesus wants me to do next. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And for some of you, you've never heard following Jesus explained like that because you thought it was just being a good person. But Jesus is inviting you to be with him before you do anything for him. So as we take this time of 120 seconds, I got two questions for you. The first one is, how are you doing with Jesus and his friendship? Are you so busy that you've neglected that friendship? And what needs to change so you can spend time with him? And the second question I want you to wrestle with tonight is simply this. Are you doing things for Jesus or are you with Jesus? Make no mistake, when you're with Jesus, you start doing things with him. But you got to do that piece first. And your life is too precious to waste it doing other things. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for every precious person in this room. They are beloved. They are seen. God, you know their story. You know their hurt. You know their stuff. And you look at them and you go, follow me. Whether they're righteous in their own eyes and they've done everything right, but they still need a savior or they have done all the things wrong. And they realize that, that even though they've done those things wrong, you love them anyway. May we all just say, Jesus, our answer to you is yes, I want the friendship. And I want to be with you. So as we take this two minutes to just be still, will you just let us know how much you care for us?